Crazy. <laughs> uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and uh, bearing with the crowded space that we have. Uh, there are two more seats. If anybody sitting back there would like to join us, we have two seats at the front over in the corner here. Okay. Um, uh, Joe's passing came as a shock to all of us, I think, and uh, we kind of had the idea that it would be really beneficial for us to just have the opportunity to talk about our, our friends, and hence a little uh, <clears throat> memorial here thrown together. Uh, but uh, I'm so glad that people have come uh, from all over for this. Uh, uh, Seth and uh, Chester are going to share some of their thoughts. But we also have uh, a very close friend of uh, Joe's, Vicky, uh, who came all the way from LA, uh, who also has some things to say. We have a message from Adrian, and uh, there'll be opportunity for uh, uh, other people to share if need be, or uh, also to maybe mingle while uh, other people watch the video. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming. So I leave the floor to. Well, after Joe's death. Chet and I were obviously shocked. Um, and we got together and we talked about, you know, the memorial for Joe. And I think um, very quickly we came to the conclusion we wrote, we both wrote things about him for the Comics Journal. And um, I don't think either of us wanted to sit down and do a formal, let's write another thing about Joe. We covered that in what we wrote. And, um, and I think that, um, it came very naturally. We thought, let's just get up and talk about it. I mean, he was our friend, and uh, uh, it was a, a rich and deep experience knowing Joe. And so, let's talk. Sure. Although first, first, um, I wanted to to mention what's up here on on the chair yeah. for Joe. Um, this is a backpack uh, that Joe had. A little picture of Felix yeah. the cat there. Vicky, his his ex girlfriend, who is yep. here from yep. Los Angeles, thoughtfully brought yeah. along uh, to to place here. It was his iconic backpack? Yeah, the Joe carried around books and things in it that he would try to pawn off <laughs> on people when you met them. <laughs> he would meet you for a minute. It's really nice to meet you. Uh, would you like to buy an old copy of a CD that I'm trying to unlock? <laughs> and that was very typical behavior. Yeah. So this is pretty iconic. You saw this every minute. Yeah. Yes, and uh, and then we thought we'd have a portrait, a photographic portrait of Joe here yeah. based on the chair. I wanted this old picture of Joe from when he was around twenty years yeah. old in art school, but Seth said he's not wearing glasses in it, and it looks like it looks wrong. I asked Vicky, and she agreed that the one yeah. with him with glasses. This would be him when he was around 40 years old. Yeah, that's the icon of Joe Matt. Um, that other one is some steadily young guy. <laughs> it's like all the school posing. Well, he's, I think he's amazingly good looking. Yeah. But... I'm like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like, I wouldn't even know that's Joe. He's been boxed up. <laughs> no, I'm not impressed. But yeah, that's not Joe. Yeah, yeah we'll, 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 we'll yeah. face this one. That's also Joe when he was young and full of ambition. <laughs> that was one of the things we were talking about yeah. earlier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how when when we first met him, he seemed convinced that drawing comics was a way to make money uh, and to, to be yeah, yeah to be financially successful and yeah famous. And I remember he said like after a few months of knowing us, he was like, "Boy, you guys really like punctured my balloon." <laughs> and so we, we were yeah we were flabbergasted that he had such like high ideal high dreams for comics. We I think both realistically knew. That it was like a you know a, an underground medium that you'd be lucky to make any money on it, mm -hmm. and eventually I think that 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 recognition of the comics were not like a gravy train to the stars did have an effect on Joe, right? Yeah, yeah. but I wanted to ask you because when we were talking about this the other day, it's like, uh, do you remember first meeting Joe? Uh, yeah, dimly, I think. Didn't we meet at Union Station? We were meeting, he was coming in on the train, maybe? I, I have some photographs, I think, from that day, but I have no memory of this at all. 
Yeah, I vaguely remember meeting him at Union Station. I think I got there first, and Chris Oliveris was there, wasn't he? First day? Where's yeah. that, where's no, that I think that was a few months later. Oh, okay. Then yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't remember Chris yeah. being there that yeah. Yeah. See, I don't remember this yeah. at all. All I remember is Joe's comic about meeting us. Okay. okay. In that comic, which as you pointed out, nothing in it ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you guys did uh, the, the, okay. There are, he he breaks it down into two parts where he has me he he meets me first yes and then there's a second time when he's visiting Toronto and he meets I I drag him over to your place yeah and yeah that's not that's not true as I said <laughs> uh, he met us both at the same time the first time and as I say I think it was at Union and Station. I think in that strip too we rushed down to an antique market yes it which never happened. It happened another day. No, no, no. Something. It did really it? did happen oh, that okay. first time we met. I yeah. I do remember this. I believe he he ends it with um you guys kind of you no he finds no no in the way the way he draws it, I guess he has you finding the viewmaster reels. Yeah, and, and then uh I think I get super, he tells me about the Viewmaster Reels and I get super interested in them. Yes. And we rush down to an antique market and I find them. You find them. And I am apologizing to him for stealing what he's collecting. But that never happened. <laughs> well, what, what happened though is I got interested in those the minute he told me about them. And then we got into a fight the, for years collecting those. The way know? I remember <laughs> that day, that yeah. first day, yeah, you, we went to the <laughs> antique market yeah. and you did find Viewmaster Reels. Okay. So did he. Yeah. And uh, one of you suggested, let's put them all together and flip a coin to oh, see okay. who gets <laughs> these yeah. masters. And he won it. Um, I remember it as being that he, he did win the first toss. Okay. And then you suggested, let's do best out of three. <laughs> really? That's, not, that's so, like, that's really bad. <laughs> I'm ashamed to hear that. <laughs> I thought, and, you know, it's not like, it, was, uh, it became this epic thing where determining the coin toss became somehow impossible. I think it, it fell down and went under some other things. And, and then there, there actually, there really was. You know, I'm sorry, you think there's a reason I don't remember this. <laughs> <laughs> there was a coin toss where the coin literally fell in a crack on the floor and was standing up straight. Just make it you know, this was, <laughs> it was so astounding that I thought, the it, Joe has to make a strip about this. It's and he did not. Though. He did not no. because he didn't want to make you look bad because oh, okay. it would have made you look like yeah. whatever. So they lost that. He could stop caring about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the funny thing about his comics were they were rarely based on truth in the true sense. Like mm -hmm. that he followed. He didn't follow like the actual facts of how things happened. In fact, I think we've often complained about like we read what words he put in our mouths and say like that's not something I would have ever said. Right. In fact, there are often things that I like the opposite of what I might have said. <laughs> but yeah. The thing yeah. about it was somehow or other Joe captured some reality though of yeah. the friendship. Yeah. It was more real than any of the details of it. And I certainly feel like in comics, like if there's any kind of an idea of who I am as a person, it's based on Joe Matt's work more than it's based on mine. Because my work is like the kind of work you do about yourself. It's like you walk around, you're it's melancholy or serious, or you take yourself seriously. But Joe's work was like he defined me as a character. Like, and it was a character that I think is more true to my surface personality. Even if I never agree with any of the stuff he said, he captures some essence of that in there, and you too. Yeah, absolutely. Your books are just some kind of an emotionless robot. <laughs> <laughs> when Joe was giving you, they were fine. <laughs> well, I, we just reread most of, the, of Joe's stuff. And I do notice, mm. I did notice in the first book, the Cartoon Diary book, he draws me with this kind of angry expression all the time. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, kind of like a mm. mean or something. And then in the later books, my my eyebrows go up like this all the time. It looks like I'm very sensitive. And, and... <laughs> That's true. But in those later books, too, it's like you are mean, though, in those ones. Those right, yeah, yeah. We're it's true. We're both mean. teasing him about not knowing who the president yeah. was during the that Civil was War. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, he did, remember when we quizzed him on, uh, this was the thing about Joe. He had, like, no interest in anything that wasn't exactly 
exactly what he was interested in. So this is why he had no general knowledge whatsoever. <laughs> so we, I remember saying, like, who did we fight in World War II? Right? And he was like, the Germans. <laughs> and I was like, yes. And who did we fight in World War I? And he was like, it can't be the Germans again. <laughs> But in his defense, when he cared about something, he certainly did. He was an inquisitive person with a, and a very smart person. Mm -hmm. And it's like Joe does not come off smart in his own books. That's yeah. I remember thinking this, or we both we both remarked on it. How anytime we would hear an interview of his or read an interview, yeah. we'd be like, "Wow, he seems really smart in this interview." Yeah, we were telling that it's like he seemed really smart. Like, what happened? <laughs> but yeah. the truth is, he was smart. He was a very smart person, and he was a really talented artist. Mm -hmm. This is the key thing that, that I don't really remember meeting him, but I remember before meeting him, how excited we were by his comics. Yeah. We were reading them over. You gave me a big stack of your yep. he sent you. And we were reading them over and over again, super excited about them. Yeah, I, I wonder if that's people's experience of Joe Matt now when they're first discovering his work, if they're, like, because we were reading it, we were reading that stack, of that photocopied stack. I, I, well, I, I was like every day for yeah, weeks. Yeah, I I, no, I read those strips over yeah. and over every day. Yeah, me too. I was like, not only was I like excited by the, how the comics were done, they were just super entertaining too. Yeah. yeah. And I think they felt super fresh at the time. There was already autobiography comics coming out at that point. I mean, there was already Harvey Picar and Linda Berry and stuff like that. Yeah, and, I I loved their work, but there was something different about Joe Matt's work. Some yeah. vitality that. It was only his. Yeah, um, and it's funny when you see those early books or the early scripts, there's a naivete to it, too, a kind of a sweetness that mm -hmm. disappears from the work over time to some degree. I mean, there's always a bit of sweetness in the books, but but I feel like the early ones, it's like he is grappling right on the page with the problems for the first time, it seems. Like when he has that, we first read those scripts about his porn addiction, that felt super fresh at the time. Right. Like people hadn't really talked about that. It seems weird now in this world that he's literally saturated with pornography, that talking about pornography and having like any kind of an addiction with it would seem like anything fresh, but it certainly did, and it was really earnest. And I remember being like, wow, this guy's really putting it out there. But of course, rereading those scripts recently, I was like, they feel very charming and sweet now. Very. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even that one where... Uh, Prostitutes giving him a hand job in a in a, a porn <laughs> or in a porn movie. It's like that comes off as like it's like a Disney comic. <laughs> now Adrian sent us a letter. I I didn't want to read it. I I want to read it now because yeah, I want to talk idea. a little bit about it. So um so this is the letter by Adrian Tomine. Um so. I'd like to take this chance to do something that I didn't do enough when Joe was around, which is to pay him a few compliments. I'll start with the one that I think would mean the most to him, that he was a great cartoonist. There are many qualities that go into being a great cartoonist. And Joe had the two that I think are absolute inarguable prerequisites, the desire, drive, and obsessiveness to make the best comics possible and the natural born talent to do so. Of all his peers, apologies to those present, I think Joe's comics were the funniest and the most readable. And if readable sounds like damning with faint praise, I challenge you to pick 10 comics at random from the racks around you and see how hard it can be to enter into the story, to differentiate the characters, to want to read all those words, to forget that you're looking at marks on paper as they come to life in your mind. There's a famous line about the comic strip Nancy, that it's harder to not read it than to read it. And I'd say with utmost respect and envy that the same is true of Joe's work. The other thing I'd like to mention about Joe is how kind and welcoming he was to me when I first weaseled my way into this industry. Even though I was an interloper, someone with neither the talent nor the experience to really deserve to be a part of the original drawn and quarterly lineup, Joe immediately treated me like a friend and a peer 
and that meant the world to me. Instead of making me feel like the anxious neophyte that I was, Joe was eager to trade art, collaborate, and even inquire at length about my process. And no, the fact that Joe did eventually sell that art of mine for a nice profit <laughs> doesn't diminish how the original trade made me feel. <laughs> I spent a fair amount of time with Joe over the years, and I always found him to be affable, inquisitive, funny, and never boring. We once shared a long transatlantic flight, and the movie they showed was Sense and Sensibility. When it was over, Joe, who was seated a few rows ahead of me, turned around and got my attention so that I could see the tears streaming down his <laughs> cheeks, which he knew I would find hilarious. <laughs> One of his last messages to me consisted of a very specific query about how I did some coloring technique, along with a cute cat video and a photo of his favorite nine, 99 cent store. His particular combination of open-hearted amiability and genuine humility didn't come through in his work very much, but it was something I always liked and admired about him and will miss very much. Um, yeah, the, the I mean, it, I, I think there's a, a, a lot in there uh, about Joe that, uh, yeah. But um, the thing that I particularly wanted to, to emphasize was that, yeah, uh, certainly of the three of us, I think Joe was, the most approachable. Yes. We were both very cold and aloof in those days. And uh, uh, I'm kind of embarrassed about how I interacted with my readers back then. Joe was the one who was approachable. Oh, he, he was, was super approachable. He was the lovable one. Yeah, he was too approachable in that neither of us wanted to be approached. <laughs> and he would bring people up. And that was like, uh, when it, he was a very friendly person. He mm -hmm. legitimately was. He made friends easily too. Um, but the funny thing was, you know, I thinking about that friendship back in those days, it was like a super important thing to me. Um, there was a quality to that that uh, I don't I don't think you get often in life, which is like where you have a very um, a deep experience with two people without talking about it, you know, or three people. As I've often said, I always feel three people is the perfect number for friendship, better than two. Because you're, it's not just one on one. It's just group experience. And um, you and I had a friendship before Joe arrived, and um, and it was a good friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, but when Joe arrived, it, it took a new quality. Mm -hmm. It became a um, well. We had a lot more laughs, probably for one thing. Joe was a very funny person, yeah. and he loved to laugh. Mm -hmm. um, after Joe died, uh, a couple of days after, I rewatched the movie uh, Scan and Ollie from a few years ago about Laura and Hardy. And I watched it on purpose because it's about friendship. And um, at some point in the film, um, Stan Laurel says about uh, about uh, Laura and Hardy, he says that um, like in our movies, we didn't know anybody and nobody knew us. And that's the way we liked it. And I thought like to some degree, that's how I felt about the three of us. We would go somewhere and someone might come up and we'd be friendly. We knew lots of people. Hi, how are you doing? Talk to them, maybe even sit down for a while. But as soon as they left, I felt like it was back to the way it should be. Just the three of us. That was a very meaningful experience to me and won't be repeated. Right. Yeah. Um, there is a particular anecdote I want to tell. Oh, yeah. About, uh, do you remember all three of us loved uh, I think most or a lot of people in the audience will know the Jack Chick religious comics. <laughs> um, so, um, we all three of us thought, uh, well, they, we particularly like the ones that were drawn by Jack Chick himself. Yeah. And um, we, we were like, wouldn't it be great if we could get, uh, you know, a Jack Chick original? But like, who's, how would we do that? He's, he's not like selling his artwork or anything. So Joe took the initiative to write to Jack Chick 
<laughs> and uh, asked for some artwork. But to make sure that he actually got the artwork, he he made up this story about having having been raised Catholic and then <laughs> reading Jack Chick's comic books and realizing he was in the wrong faith and he'd been uh, converted to, to becoming a proper Christian. And thank you, Jack, for, for revealing the light to me. And by the way, could you send me some original artwork? <laughs> Funny, I don't remember this at all. You're not, not at all. No. I was going to say that, that thing about me, uh, you know, in the Game Master Reels made me look bad, but this really makes Joe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. It's funny how, like, our memories do not match up, like, wow. this stuff. That's such a big, iconic type story. I'm surprised. Yeah, you, you were horrified by this. Was I? I <laughs> see, no. Very That's judgmental. Funny. It's like when we saw each other after Joe died, we were talking about him, and I told you an anecdote, and I didn't remember it at all, and I was amazed because it's a defining anecdote, anecdote to me about Joe, is that Joe said to me one day, he said, you know, if I ever find myself out in the street as a homeless person, he said, I have a plan, and I was like, oh yeah, what's your plan, Joe? And he said, I'm going to start, like, I will have these pink garbage bags, and I will go around, and I will gather up garbage, and leave it by the side of the road, and people will be like, eventually be like, Hey, it's the guy with the pink garbage bags. And I said to him, like, so your plan when you're homeless is to be famous? <laughs> I was like, where are you getting the pink garbage bags from? And how do they make pink garbage bags? Like, details, details. That's like, I was like, my plan would be to not be homeless. <laughs> if you didn't remember that at all, to me, that defines Joe in every way. So it's completely crazy. And it's like, yeah, at the core of it, he was still always interested in somehow getting attention. You know, it was just funny because that defined his personality a lot too. Even re when re Adrian was, re that thing Adrian wrote, which was very beautiful. Um, that turning around to show you're crying because he yes. knows he'll laugh at you. It's like most people, they wouldn't do that. They'd be like, no, I'm there. <laughs> My friends will see me laughing and see me crying and sense and sensibility. No, he was like, I can melt this. <laughs> well, I remember him talking about watching Little House on the Prairie all the time and how it would bring him to, that would bring yeah. him to tears. Yeah, no, he was a weeper. And uh, to be honest, I think like I, I appreciated in that, that in him because I could relate to it myself. I'm a sucker for those kind of things. Not Little House and Fairy, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, easy to cry. And as you get older, it gets easier and easier to cry. Not maybe for some people. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> those of us will be in the room. How are we doing for time? Uh, it is uh, 10 to 9. So, yeah. uh, I will tell you a story. Okay. Okay, this is a story I've never told before. I've never told you this story before either. And that is, it's about fr friendship to some degree. When I was a child, probably in grade school, I had a dream one night where I was one of the, uh, the, the musical band, The Monkeys. And, um, and, and even though I was probably only in like grade seven or something, there was no logic in how I was in the band. But, because I was, you know, grade seven. But when I woke up from the dream, I was so upset that I was not in the monkey because it meant like I was part of something. It was so important, it seemed. I was like so thrilled that I was in this group that I never forgot the dream. I mean, it's just a minor nothing dream, but I still remember that dream. And I remember the terrible disappointment of not being one of the monkeys. Because to many, many years later, I mean, the three of us are walking down the street in the annex, I guess. And um, suddenly it occurred to me, like we've been friends for a few years. I thought to myself, like I looked around at you two guys and I said, this is as close as I'm ever getting to being in the monkey. <laughs> and um, I really did feel that. that was, it was an important, and some, a group you can't be kicked out of. Right. And Joe, it's like, you know, I don't believe in the afterlife. We'll see him again. Well, I do believe in the, in the afterlife. So, yeah, I, I do believe in the afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we, should we ask him? Vicky, did you want to speak? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Can I, I'll sit with you, or I mean, yeah. I'll just Funny. Let oh, me sit with oh, you. Oh, I forgot they're they're showing the the photos. Yes. Do you want to sit together? No, no, no. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, gosh. Uh, hi. Um, my name is uh, Vicky Kraus. Um, maybe you know if, if you follow Joe on social media, he would uh, often 
Um, he, he was very impulsive, but also calculating in his impulsions too, right? He would um, be very particular about the language that he would use in uh, writing his posts. So sometimes he would uh, post about spending time with his, his ex's <laughs> nieces, uh, my two nieces, Izumi and Aki. Um, he spent a lot of time with, uh, that's my brother's kids. And so, you know, um, of course, I, I didn't, you know, realize how much he adored them. Uh, I mean, I knew he adored them, but like the the, um, the significance and the impact um, that his relationship with my nieces and my brother had um, on the family, you know, I, I'm just hearing more about now uh, from my brother. So anyway, um, before I read, I, I wrote an essay just because I, I needed to write it out and process my, you know, feelings uh, uh, in, in this experience since his death. Um, but uh, I wanted to just say that he called his backpack his knapsack. Uh, I remember, um, you know, commenting on his backpack and he corrected me, it's knapsack. And, and, and the other thing, um, actually, thank you so much, Adrian, for your beautiful letter. Um, I want to assure you that uh, here, here's a, it's just a short little story. He, uh, when we lived together, uh, we lived together for a little over seven years and we were a couple for over eight. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, almost eight. And um, uh, something that he, you know, was known to be, I'm sure you see in his comics, he loved to uh, condense his collection. If, if an omnibus was about to come out of, you know, whatever series, he would get rid of the, you know, the single um, individual uh, hardbacks and then um, buy that or trade, you know, for that omnibus. So this also applied to my collection of books, uh, I, um, I had, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a comics nerd, but I appreciate uh, comics, and uh, and so I had a, you know, a, a small collection of my favorites, and um, he couldn't help himself but to scan my bookshelves or, or our bookshelves, and you know, the the precious real estate on those bookshelves, and so this included um, multiple copies of whatever uh, books that he had, and of course I had, so he would consider my copies, the additional copies. Um, and so why do we need a second or a third copy, you know, and this included his own books too. So um, a lot of, you know, lovable pestering from him. And I just gave up and I said, fine, take them. I don't care. You know, we, we have, we have your copies. I can, and he would tell me, you can go to the library and read uh, those copies. You know, what, what do you need? Uh, what do we need multiple copies in the house for? So um, he took a lot of, um, my books and traded them for credit at his favorite music store. And this is not to, you know, slam him. It's just that this, he had a logic and the logic was space is, you know, valuable. Real estate is valuable. We, we you know, we need to be considerate of um, our tiny apartment and uh, what comes in and what goes out. So, um, but anyway, uh, so uh, he took all of the copies of um, his books that were, that I bought and they, they are now gone. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't any, own any of his books, actually. It's, it's kind of funny. It's my Jomat story, um, one of many. But um, after we broke up, um, over the past five years since we've been broken up, um, he was very present in my life. Uh, we were neighbors, and he stopped by my place all the time. And um, there, there was a period where I was quite upset with him because I would start to scan my bookshelves if I was remembering, like, oh, I wonder what, what happened to that book. And then I text him or call him and say, you took my book, you know, <laughs> I want it back, you know, make it happen. And um, he couldn't make it happen because these were, you know, first editions. And um, so anyway, but uh, over the past few years, he would just on his walks at late at night, he, you know, call and say, hey, I'm outside, I uh, have some books, you want them? <laughs> and this included um, single issues of uh, Jason's comics. And and one of them um, is uh, Adrian's um uh, shortcomings that Adrian you drew in and uh, you addressed to Joe and uh, I'll, I'll tell you if you remember Adrian it's a it's a it's a picture of you and Joe sitting next together it's probably what like early 2000s late 90s I'm not sure but it's if you and Joe sitting together looking or gawking at a pretty woman and um and uh, uh, the the word balloon says uh, out of Joe's mouth it says um and she's a little long in the tooth. Uh, it's funny. I, I, I think it's hilarious. Um, so uh, I have that book. I'll keep it um, precious. And uh, actually, Adrian, you also wrote um, uh, Don't Sell This. And he didn't. And it's in my, my possession now. And I'll, I'll uh, take care of it um, uh, for the rest of my life. 
and then pass it on to hopefully the Smithsonian or something. But I'm um, sorry to go on. I, I, I if you if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read this essay. If that's okay, and it'll give you kind of a, a picture of our history as a as a, a couple. And we were the long of, uh, out of his relationships with women. Um, I. Uh, I, I guess I have to say I'm, I'm probably the the longest uh, um, sir, or the the oldest girl maybe one of the oldest older girlfriends and I'm 40 can you believe it and uh, and um, we had the longest relationship or he had the longest relationship with me so um, it was something that he was actually quite proud. I do of. know that when I met you and Joe, I thought to myself, what is this girl doing with Joe? She seems totally normal. <laughs> so, a lot of people said that actually. <laughs> But um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it in stride. Um, so uh, I titled this on living with a cartoonist, part one. If Joe Matt knew how large a hole he would leave in the hearts of so many upon his sudden and unexpected departure, I'm pretty sure he'd fill that hole up with books. More specifically, I know he would take measurements and adjust the size of the hole exactly to fit his book collection of Al Cap's Will Abner dailies. I say this for two reasons. While he loved the Will Abner strip, he was equally ashamed of this fact. Joe likened Will Abner to raunchy, working-class entertainment. There was nothing wrong with this, not in the slightest, but Joe had a hard time reconciling this fact with his love and admiration for the great American comic strips that had the deeper messages. The comics he held in high esteem and had deep respect for were few and far between. They were Crazy Cat, Little Nemo, Little Orphan Annie, Peanuts, and Mouse. Everything else, however good, paled in comparison. I may be missing some comics here, and I defer to Chester and Seth for additional accurate information. These books, among others, that were in his pristine collection, near mint with covered dust jackets, would not be stored in the aforementioned hole. However, know that he would take it into consideration, contemplate, and mull it over for longer than necessary. Either way, he'd not want anyone to feel bad, and I think he would love to know that we miss him terribly, holes and filling them aside. Joe and I met in person for the first time in 2008 at an art opening at Secret Headquarters in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, through our mutual friend and one of Joe's ex-girlfriends, Maggie. Maggie, who I met in 2007, told me then that she thought I ought to meet Joe Matt because she thought we'd get along based on our shared interests and personalities. The encounter in 2008 was brief and I barely recall it. Joe, on the other hand, told me years later that he did in fact remember meeting me. I was surprised and thought he was making it up, but I quickly learned that Joe can never lie. It was impossible. I am the same. The guilt would eat at us. When we met again in 2010, he told me he did in fact remember meeting me at Secret Headquarters two years prior. He said about our very first in-person encounter that he thought to himself, hmm, not Asian enough. I laughed when I heard this. I loved his honesty and overall comedic timing. Just a side note, I'm actually half Japanese, half uh, Jewish. So uh, I think his friend told him that I I'm kind of Asian, you know. <laughs> um, it was in early November 20, 2010 that Joe rode his bicycle one late afternoon to Cafecito Organico, a small independent coffee shop in Silver Lake where I used to work. The place Joe normally went to for coffee was Choke, a moped repair shop with a couch and pinball machines. Choke stopped serving coffee altogether that year, and the guys there, Nick and Jeff, told Joe to go to a to go a little further down the street to Cafecito. Joe came in on a, on a Saturday afternoon at around 4 p.m. by himself. After he parked his bicycle, Joe walked in wearing his worn-out hat, his large army green knapsack, and a big smile. I didn't remember him from 2008. What I gathered when he walked in was that he seemed like a friendly, polite, and lonely middle-aged guy. I was working by myself, and when he walked in, he was the only person in the shop. He ordered a hot Americano in a paper cup and asked me how much the rosemary shortbread cookie cost. When I told him that the cookie cost, the cookie alone cost $4, I got the feeling he might be short on cash. So I rung him up for just the cookie. I don't think he realized that I didn't charge him for the coffee because when he handed me his $5 bill, he had a firm grip and nearly wouldn't let go, which I thought was hilarious and chuckled. He finally let go of the cash with a sort of coy smile, and when I gave him his change of one dollar, I sensed his reluctance in leaving it in the tip jar, <laughs> but he did. From there, I took charge as any friend friendly barista like Sam from Cheers would and struck up conversation with him. I asked him how his day was, what he was up to. He was very frank and told me with a smile on his face that he had just gotten out of bed a little while before and was just starting the day. 
He said he normally went to Choke, but they stopped serving coffee and that they told him to come here. I told him that I knew Nick and Jeff and that connection lit him up. As other customers walked in throughout the rest of my shift, Joe stood at the counter opposite the coffee bar and looked out the window. He set his backpack or knapsack on the floor and sipped on his coffee and nibbled at the shortbread. When it was just him and me again in the shop, I felt compelled to continue leading the conversation to make him feel acknowledged and assure him that I was paying attention. I commented on the Felix the cat patch sewed on his backpack. I'm um, sorry, <laughs> Ooh, where'd he go? Uh, sewed on his backpack. He seemed impressed that I knew who Felix the cat was and he corrected me and called his bag his knapsack. I think I asked him where he was from because there was no one I knew who I grew up in LA with who called their backpacks knapsacks. It was either an East Coast, rural, or old timey thing. Joe confirmed that he was from a suburb outside of Philadelphia. From there, we chatted about cartoons and books. He told me about his usual route on his bicycle, which included going to Amoeba and hitting a spot on Melrose nearby called Vlad the Retailer. I told him that I knew Aaron, the, the proprietor of Vlad's. Somehow, this led to Joe telling me that he was a cartoonist and that Aaron carried copies of his books at the shop. I found that interesting, and after a while of continued conversation, I realized that he was Maggie's ex. I told him that I knew Maggie and that we'd met before. He said he didn't remember me from 2008, but was surprised to learn of our mutual connections. Joe ended up hanging out at the cafe that afternoon for about three hours before I started cleaning up. Before he left, he asked me if I'd like to go see the Harry Potter film at the, at the art flight with him. He had a friend there that could get us in for free. <laughs> I thought about it for a minute and said, sure, why not? I can't remember if it was the same evening or the next night, but our first date involved me picking him up from his place and driving us to a late night Thai restaurant in Thai town called Torung. Joe brought with him his small and large sketchbooks, his books, and some small toys, uh, all stuffed neatly in his knapsack. We sat at the restaurant for probably four hours. He did most of the talking, but he was curious to hear about me and my life. He was quick to ask me how many boyfriends I'd had and how many men I'd slept with in total so far. I wasn't at all offended by these questions. In fact, I thought it was great that he asked. And I was honest, as was he. Two weeks later, Joe told me he loved me. I told him that that was way too fast to tell, one, tell someone such a thing. He said he was just being honest, and I knew that he was. Maybe it was two weeks after that that I told him I loved him too. I also meant it. From there, Joe and I were a couple from... November 2010 to February 2018. We were practically inseparable. We didn't have the money to go anywhere or do very many interesting things. Life was very simple, sometimes boring, but very simple. The most we did was take a few trips to Philadelphia to visit his family. We drove up to San Francisco once to visit friends. We went to Santa Inez for a friend's birthday and Lone Pine for a friend's wedding. The last thing, thing we did as a couple was to take a short trip to Joshua Tree in December 2017. Shortly thereafter, I ended our relationship in February, 2018. Joe and I lived together in a small and sparse one bedroom apartment in the Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles from August, 2011 through June, 2018. Joe always recognized our living situation as pure luxury from his point of view. The fact that it was just us two who shared a bathroom, the fact that we shared a bedroom, that we had a full size kitchen and an accessible refrigerator, laundry on site and in the neighborhood that we loved never escaped him and he always expressed his gratitude for this. On the other hand, I complained about our noisy neighbors upstairs and next door and our thin walls. For Joe, it was good enough, if not more than good enough. I couldn't wrap my head around that. After a while, I wanted more, more space, a couch, a coffee table, an inviting space for guests. Joe was not on board for that unless we won the lottery and there was no arguing with him otherwise. Aside from this, we were, we were very much two peas in a pod. We shared similar interests and dispositions. We loved being in each other's company and knowing we had each other's company. We enjoyed the simple pleasures of taking long walks, stopping at coffee shops, watching television shows on DVD, listening to old radio shows like Dragnet, Perry Mason, Burns and Allen, Jack Benny, and Gene Shepard, spending time at libraries and used bookstores, going to the movies on the occasions his friend could get us in for free, and sharing meals together. Joe loved to talk, and I genuinely loved to listen. Very quickly into our relationship, we referred to each other as one another's spouses. Joe constantly reminded me of his love and gratitude for having me in his life, for his utter disbelief that he found someone he could be comfortable enough with to sing and dance around, and that he could be 100% himself without reservation. Whenever we'd watch television, never streaming, only on DVD in our bedroom, depending on the program, Joe would cry at the drop of a hat. 
He had many catchphrases, but this one he would say often after he'd sniff and wipe away his tears. I'm too sensitive for this world. <laughs> As I grieve Joe's loss, I've been turning to various spiritual texts and articles for comfort and spiritual assurance that human life does indeed transcend death. I've been rereading an essay on the Buddhist perspective of mirrors, an essay that I've read and reread over the past 25 years. In this 10-page essay, there is discussion on the function of the traditional glass mirror we look into daily to observe and make up, make up our physical selves. Then there is a spiritual mirror that reflects one's true inner self, the self that cannot be hidden or masked. According to Buddhism, one's purpose in life ultimately is to strive to reveal one's true self. Reading this essay at 40 years old, um, with the accumulated life experiences that I've had so far, I'm understanding the concepts of reflection, self-reflection, and the oneness of self and environment from an entirely new and different perspective. Joe's departure, as rawly unfair it feels and is, is what it took for me to deeply look at both my physical and spiritual reflection in the most honest way I've ever experienced, and in a way that I've never, never experienced before. It is forcing me to examine what the pursuit of true happiness is for me, something I've suppressed out of habit and denied myself since childhood for many reasons, but I won't get into that. For now, from my limited understanding of physics, Buddhism, life and death, even and even the, great, the power of communication and concise and articulate writing, I know that Joe had far greater and lasting impact on people than he realized. I wish that he knew this and understood it deeply with his heart while he was still with us. The incredible thing that has happened with Joe's departure is how he has brought so many people together, many of whom are aware of each other but have not met yet. For the people who did know each other among Joe's circle of friends, it's brought us closer in a surprising yet unsurprising way. These are facts and they cannot be denied. Joe would have liked this as he generally preferred factual information. Despite the hole that there is, that there is I'm sorry, despite the hole that is there that should be Joe, I am somberly reassured that Joe is okay and we will be too. Thank you. Um, but Seth and I weren't Joe's only friends when he was here in Toronto. Um, I, I, I don't know, uh, William, like your friendship was enormously important to, to Joe when he was here. I, I, I'm springing this on you. Feel free to say no, but would you like to say a, a few? No, I'm no. enjoying. I, oh, I'm okay. Enjoying. Okay. But, but yeah. yeah. I was going to um, say, if anybody wants to say anything about Joe, we don't feel any pressure. But it's like we're not like, we're filling time here. But if anybody wants to say anything, feel free to speak up. Um, I was just going to say that uh, not everyone know, will know this, but there are many people in the audience who are among the characters in the comic, not just the two yeah. that were the friends. If, yeah. and it, but, and who who here is portrayed in? Well, Joe would deny. Joe would deny that it's true. Yeah. 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 Both of you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There we go. Steve so, must be back there. Steve fell on us. Yes, I see yeah. Steve was here. Okay. Uh, okay, but I don't know. Uh, Can I share an anecdote? Please. Sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Hey, everybody. My name is Blake Bell, and back in 2002, and if you'll indulge me for 60 seconds for the context, because the anecdote to me really summarized. Joe and the glee he took out of life. Uh, I had published uh, my first book in 2002 of questionable quality, but it had a cast of characters from the fact that I interviewed the spouses and the, the cartoonists from all the way from Anne and Will Eisner down to Joni and Stan Lee and Alan Moore and Melinda Gebby. But the one chapter in the book that Joe took particular interest in was the chapter where I interviewed Denny Lubert. So for those who don't know, Denny Lubert, of course, was the co-founder and co-publisher of Aardvark Vanaheim and Renegade, the founder of Renegade Comics. But she was also, of course, married to Dave Sim. So I interviewed her in the book. And while we were at the Beguiling, Joe came up to me, as, as you three were often there, Joe came up to me and said, Blake, I got a copy of your book. And last week I was hanging out with Dave Sim 
and I was reading quotes from your book of the worst stuff that Denny had said about Dave. And all these pictures you see here of Joe with the biggest grin on his face. Like, you know, Norm Macdonald, the Canadian comedian, and how he would just be so, you know, petulant like a child with no filter. The biggest smile he's And he was literally quoting, he had the book, and he was, I don't know whether I, I was doing a signing at that time, but he had the book open chapter, and he was reading the sections that he was quoting to Dave and just that glee on his face, like he had just screwed over his buddy. So, and he was so happy that he had an opportunity to do that. That smile that you see in all of these pictures, that to me represented Joe in my memory. So that's, that's pretty true. I mean, I think the thing too is thinking of Joe is like, I bet you you'd be hard pressed to get him to admit there was anything devious about it. So because <laughs> you know, that's exactly the kind of thing he would do that he would be, you know, but it was, you know, it be no what was in the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share that memory. So thank you, sir. Thanks, Blake. Do you want to say anything else, Chad, or do you want to wrap up? Um, yeah, I think I'm fine with wrapping up. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I just like to end on saying, like, uh, I think Joe would be really pleased to see like this turn out. It would mean a lot to him. Mm -hmm. I, there's been there's a memorial coming up in Los Angeles as well, and his family in Philadelphia. Joe affected a lot of people's lives, and um, I think on some level Joe would be a bit flabbergasted to see that people really did care. I think he, I sadly think he felt a little forgotten by this point because he hadn't done any work in quite a few years now. Um, but I think he. I think he'd both be very happy about this, and I also think he probably would skip it. <laughs> like, can we just? I'll just come after because yeah. it sounds pretty boring. <laughs> and uh, the funny thing is, is he would he, the main thing he would have said like was where the laughs, and so I'm glad that, that people were laughing. Yeah, yeah. So thank you all for this. Yes, thank you. And that video is going to play again for those who yeah. didn't see it. Without music, overlay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we I said I missed it. But did he get any artwork from Jack Chick? Did that happen? Did I not say? Oh, you did. Okay, I'm sorry. I, 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 I,